Good afternoon, everyone, and happy spring. I'm Catherine Brookman, Associate Director of Knowledge Transfer and Exchange. And on behalf of Dr. Jack Callahan, Director of the Center of Research Expertise for the Prevention of Musculoskeletal Disorders, or CREAMSD as we are more commonly known, we'd like to thank you for joining us today for this free webinar on Conducting Home Office Virtual Assessments, How Is It Done? and what you need to know to set up your home office workstation. We are grateful to the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development for our funding, which supports the delivery of these webinars and to our presenters who provide their expertise. This webinar will be recorded with the recording being made available to you on our website, along with the presenter's slides shortly after today's webinar. The format of today's webinar is as follows. The presentation will be given after which time we will have 10 to 15 minutes for a question and answer period with our presenters. During the question and answer period, we ask that you type your questions into the chat box. The chat box can be pulled up on your screen. Should you have any questions for our presenters, we ask that during the question and answer period, you put your questions in the chat box that can be pulled up on your screen by selecting the chat icon in the control panel that appears near the bottom of your screen. I will relay these questions to our presenter or a similar question should we have duplicate themes. You will be muted for the entire presentation to ensure there is no background noise disruption. Of course, if you have a pressing question or an issue such as a technology glitch that cannot wait until the end of the presentation, please type this into the chat box and we will do our best to address it right away. At the end of the webinar, you will be also sent a link to an evaluation. We ask that you fill this out in order to help us plan for the future delivery of our webinars. We'd like to thank you for joining us today and remind you to watch the CREA-MSD website and the MSD prevention site for other webinars and resources and events, including our next webinar on June the 10th, assessing the effect of hip flexor stretching program on spine kinematics while performing overhead tasks. Now, just before we get started today, we have a really exciting announcement. Next slide, please. Today, we are launching our redeveloped MSD Prevention Guideline for Ontario website. This has been a collaborative process with all of our system partners and website users to redevelop the website to make it easier to use and find the resources you are looking for. Next slide, please. To quickly highlight some of the new website features, the main navigation menu is now grouped by type of user, so you can find a page specific to your user group with relevant resources. We have an interactive type of MSD page. We have added an interactive guideline selector, so if you're not sure which of our four guidelines are the best fit for your organization, including the Quick Start Guideline Office, the guideline selector page will walk you through a few questions to recommend the best guideline for you. We have improved the resource library functionality with additional filters and an improved search function. Each of these pages that I have referred to has a link on the slide and we will provide the links in the chat. We invite you to check out the website and share it with your colleagues as well. Now, over to our presenters. I'd like to introduce via a short bio, Kelly Hogan. Kelly is a Canadian certified professional ergonomist. She is director of injury prevention services at Sandalwood of Canada. She has a bachelor and a master's degree in kinesiology, specializing in biomechanics from the University of Waterloo. 
She began her career working in clinical kinesiology, completing functional abilities testing and exercise prescription. She pivoted her career to ergonomics and has worked in a variety of industries, including automotive manufacturing, food manufacturing, technology, nuclear, and office environments. From 2008 to 2015, she was the Senior Manager, Global Facilities Governance and Workplace Design, and a Global Manager, Ergonomics Health and Safety Programs for BlackBerry, where she defined global, standard ergonomic processes, procedures, standardized workplace and equipment design, along with pandemic planning. Currently, Kelly is managing a team of ergonomists in Canada and the US, providing support to many industries, including automotive, logistics, and warehousing. Also presenting with us today is Melissa Statham. Melissa is also a Canadian certified professional ergonomist working at the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, also known as OCAL. She has worked there for the past eight years, where she provides ergonomic expertise to assist workers who've been injured on the job, educate workers, educate the Joint Health and Safety Committees, and employers in ergonomics and provide worksite assessments. Melissa received her master's degree in human kinetics, specializing in ergonomics from the University of Windsor. Now, it is my pleasure to turn over this presentation to our two presenters, starting with Kelly. Next slide. Thanks everybody and welcome. Good afternoon and thank you to CREMSD for this opportunity to talk today on virtual office assessments. Today we're gonna cover the following topics and that we really, really hope that by the end and we're all completed that you'll be able to take away some tips and tricks how to better perform virtual assessments. Next slide. So just to give this talk some context, we put together some stats we found were really, really interesting and maybe guiding the need for these virtual office assessments. So as you can see, April 2020, there was a rise uh, due to pandemic. 40% of Canadians were working most of their hours from home. And this has recently uh, been assessed at 20%. So we've had a fall. However, it's important to note that prior to the pandemic in May of 2016, only 7% of Canadians were working from home. So that's a considerable increase overall. In addition to that, hybrid work, meaning you work a few days from home and a few days from work, has also been slowly increasing. And as of November 2023, 11.7% are working hybrid. So what we also found is that one in four people prefer to work more uh, hours from home and one in eight prefer to work lesser hours from home. So I think that the desire to work from home can be linked at, or the desire not to work from home can be linked to how your home office is set up, what your environment is like, and if it's conducive to being productive and giving you a work-life balance that you strive for. Not everybody can have a home office that they can close the door on at the end of the day. Some people are working from a kitchen table. Some people have family and others around them all the time. And this may not make the space at home as conducive as it will be for others. This all needs to be considered as we're doing our virtual assessments, whether they're from home or from a hybrid work arrangement, as it will greatly influence the recommendations you make to reduce the risk. So the purpose of office assessments. I'm not going to talk specifically about it, but I do just want to touch on this because the, the purpose of doing virtual office assessments is really no different. Done in person, employees are working on site in an office. The equipment being adjusted is there and the assessor is on site with them and the work is being used. The same, same equipment is being used each day. It's easy to make observations and take measurements and recommendations for new equipment may be considered by what's already existing in the office and can be moved around. All of that is very different when we move into a virtual assessment scenario. Next slide. Okay, so now that work has changed, 
we have to figure out how to ensure that we're still providing a really good assessment for the people that are working from home. And I just want to point out that not all virtual assessment requests are for people working from home. We are often seeing that geographically, um, we're being opened up to be able to provide virtual assessments to people in office that are located anywhere and everywhere. And that's a really nice pro of being able to do this. But for the most part, we are still finding that virtual assessments are being requested for home office. So shifting to virtually initially happened out of necessity. We were not allowed into the office. We were not allowed on site and we were not allowed in homes. But now we're continuing to work remotely or in hybrid. And some of this is still true. Ideally, there's a huge liability moving into somebody's home to do an assessment. So we are trying to find other ways to provide that support and this virtual assessment process is a means to do it. One of the things to keep in mind is the virtual assessment itself is not just the, the assessment and recommendations, but there is a really, really keen aspect of education um, in this space. Education and communication is going to be most important. Um, there's some cost savings that can happen because now we're having not having to travel on site. Um, and there's some really good things that are going to come out of being able to do virtual office assessments for a variety of workplaces. Um, just to note at the end of this assessment, we're going to provide you with some, some ideas on home office recommendations, but also point out that there's still difficulties. And I mean, if you have questions, we still have questions as well. And we hope to have a really good discussion around that. So our process itself, if you've done office assessments is no different. So the steps themselves, you have to define the purpose, observe and collect information, evaluate, provide adjustments and recommendations and do a follow-up. You do the same if you're doing an in-person assessment, the steps are the same. But how we complete each one of these steps is going to be different and the virtual assessment to be successful, we need to do them differently. Next slide. Hi. So what's different between an in-person and the virtual assessment? You'll see that most of the difference is that some of the responsibilities previously held by the assessor are now being transferred to the employee. Communicating this and how it needs to be done is going to be key. And you'll see that throughout that I'm going to say communication, 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 because it is one of the most important things that will lead to success with the virtual assessments. So let's go through some of the responsibilities. Okay. Um, actually, next slide. Okay. I'm going to talk pros and cons before I talk responsibilities. <laughs> um, I think based on the division of the responsibilities of the assessor and the employee, there are pros and cons to conducting the virtual assessment. So as I mentioned, you, there's no travel time. There's no traffic, there's no parking, there's no public transportation to deal with. The timing of the assessments can be more standardized. The scheduling can be more flexible. And sometimes you can actually get more assessments done in one day than you could previously. You also may not have to keep notes on a pen and paper and transfer them into your electronic report. You can maybe fill out your report while you're doing your discussion with the employee and that might save some time. But there are some cons to the virtual assessment that need to be overcome. The employees are responsible for taking measurements, the photos. The photos may not be ideal that we receive. We rely on the employee to make their own adjustments. We might not be able to see the adjustments in real time. And not all people are as body aware as we are as ergonomists, and sometimes those aren't done perfectly. The process from start to end also, and this is very important, can sometimes be longer. Well, why is the process longer doing virtual assessment? It seems like there's lots of really good pros to this. Well, now we have to rely on the employee to send us information before heading into our assessment and everybody has competing priorities. If I show up at your desk, most employees are going to give me the time. I'm there, uh, they're there. They're going to give me the time. We're gonna get the assessment done right now. But if I have to ask you for photos and you have to do a quite a bit of work before we get into that assessment, sometimes that leads to delays and often, not often, sorry, sometimes the process can be discontinued. The employee just gives up and abandons it. So that is a big con that needs to be overcome. And again, communication is the key and it'll take practice for you as the assessor to ensure that you're getting your instructions across properly 
and collecting the information that you need accurately. So let's go and talk about some of these, um, the things that we recommend to do it better. So the first step is doing a questionnaire. It's always a useful way to get good, good data and to start your communication to guide your conversation. So you can include in your questionnaire, not just comfort or discomfort, but you can ask information about their workstation setup, the duties and tasks they complete, the equipment that they have available to them to use, and even some of anthropometric data like their height and their right-handedness. All of this information, along with the photos that you'll get, and we're gonna talk about in a minute, are going to help you put a full picture together, and then you'll be able to review that before the meeting and formulate your approach to provide the information back to the employee and guide the assessment and the recommendations. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about imaging. Images are very, very important to this process and they need to be taken from the correct angles and they need to be the correct type. So how are we going to be able to do this? Um, what we do when we're doing virtual assessments, we actually have a guide that tells them, these are the type of photos that we need from you. And here's some tips for making it successful to get those photos. Um, ensuring that the employee has access to this beforehand, guiding them through that this is going to be examples of what we need is going to be beneficial. And it's going to be very, very beneficial to take the time up front to guide the employee as it's going to take save you time when you get to that assessment. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit more about photos. Let me go into our next slide. So here, not only do we say, these are the photos we want, and here's some tips to help, but we also give them examples of what those photos are. What are some good photos and what are some bad photos? So here you can see in the green, those images would be acceptable for us that are going to help us get an idea of what to do. But the ones that with the red and the X's are not so good. We don't want selfies, um, different fisheye lenses and different things are not going to help us and the bad angles aren't going to help either. So this is, again, really useful in decreasing our delays and the back and forth over email in terms of asking for the correct photos. If you can give them the instructions up front, hopefully the results that you get will be better at the end. Okay. We also include um, FAQs, and the FAQs is part of that communication. Here is, you know, why do I have to be in the images? So some individuals are not comfortable being in their own images, but we know that we need them in the images in order to do our job. So as we're going through, we really try to get those FAQs in place to make them more comfortable with what the process is going to be and why we need the information that we do need. Next slide. Hi. So webcam use. Can a webcam help you with assessments? Um, they can be very useful in terms of the communication and to give you that big, big picture, but they aren't going to be useful in doing your assessment. We don't want anybody to really rely on webcam data, which is from one angle only, and not using the images that we asked for previously. Webcams can provide the assessor with limited views and angles, and it's unlikely you're going to capture those uh, key aspects to do your assessment properly. But as I mentioned, they're really good as a communication tool. So use it as an uh, uh, addition to everything else you're asking for, but not as your main approach. Next slide. Okay, this may seem very obvious, but I do really want to make sure that you understand that the most successful virtual office assessments are done when you and the employee are together on a call, looking at the same thing at the same time, pointing at the images, providing education, and having a discussion on the risks that are, are observed. When you're doing this together at the same time, you can make real-time equipment adjustments and you can guide the employee on how those are done. You can ask them addition clarifying questions on what adjustments their chair does and how exactly they work. And so it's very important to have these synchronous assessments, you and the employee on the call together. Next slide. Okay. So now I'm gonna move into some of the tools that we're using. Um, to help us guide our discussions. In this case, we're using PowerPoint, but you could use any sort of presentation software that you'd like to use. What I'm really trying to show here is that we're using visuals again. We're using arrows, we're using colored lines. 
uh, if we're asking for information and we're taking measurements, we're giving them in different colored lines so that they understand what we're comparing and what they're what we ask them for. We're using the arrows to point out where we see risks or issues or what just the area that we're talking about. We're going to provide real examples of the, uh, recommended reach zones, um, visual uh, orientation, neck postures, et cetera, to get them to understand and trust in us that we're using real uh, valid data to make the recommendations that we're making. Go to the next slide. Okay, so here's an example of a slide that we would use in a conversation with an, an, an employee. So a couple of things to point out. You can see the colors that are being used. They're pointing to a photo of a regular, uh, unacceptable posture in the office. And then uh, some of the same thing in the real situation. So we're going to talk about the purple line and we're going to talk about the blue line. And then let's talk about the, the yellow arrow, which is the armrest. And we're going to guide the employee while they're looking at the photo, while they're sitting at their desk, to try to understand why we're making the adjustments that we're making. And we're going to do this step by step. So on this one slide, we're only going to talk about this. Go to the next slide. In the next slide, I know this is a different um, orientation, but you know, they have an office and they have, they work from their kitchen table. So we have a different picture. So we're now talking about a different thing. So now the person is sitting at the kitchen table and they're working. But again, we haven't commented on the neck posture here. We're still talking about the back and the feet. So each slide is going to outline where the risk is and it's gonna guide our conversation so that it's as specific as possible and the employee understands the changes that are required. Okay, one last one. You can see here, we've changed the image of what we're comparing it to, and but we still have the red line, the green line, and we're showing where the, where the concerns are. So this really helps that visual understanding um, what office risks are, providing that education as you're stepping the person through the office assessment and ensuring that it's as successful and communicated as best possible. So what I did is I tried to provide an upfront view of how we prepare and start to do our assessment. I'm now going to pass it over to Melissa and Melissa is going to actually take you through step by step how to complete one. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so conducting an office assessment, it's a, a process that, you know, you kind of similarly go through the same steps each time. And it really was reflective of what you would do if you actually went into to do one physically. So one of the benefits of conducting a virtual assessment is having the ability to collect a lot of information from the client before meeting with them. So like Kelly had mentioned, that there's a lot more put on the client getting the assessment than there is when we just show up. So we're relying on them for those pictures before completing that discomfort questionnaire. But in turn, what it does for us is that the time there can be very efficient because we've got a lot of information prior to even conducting it. When it comes to taking notes during the assessment, you can have it done electronically. So you could have your template um, all set up ahead of time and you can type in the responses that you get from the client when you're doing it. In, you can also do pen and paper. I'm not going to lie. I am still very old school with that. Even when I'm doing virtual assessments, I prefer to write it down, but it is a, a huge time savings too. If you can type that directly into a template. So when you're conducting a virtual assessment, there's a general flow pertaining to the information you collect. So these four points here are gonna be expanded upon in the next slides, but just to briefly address them, initially the assessor is going to collect information specific to how the person's work is being performed. So, you know, their job duties, breaks, hours, shifts, you're gonna get some anthropometric data from them and have them address any discomforts or concerns they may have have regarding the workstation. The next step is that you're going to have that observation period. And this is where that information of the images and everything that could be collected from the client prior to the assessment, you're going to review them. And you can look at them within the PowerPoint and compare them like Kelly showed earlier. 
Adjustments are the next thing that would happen while you're doing the assessment. If there's any equipment that can be moved because it's flagging risk factors, that could be monitor orientation. Um, it could be even going through the adjustments of the chair. You want to try to make those adjustments right then. There are cases where, you know, it might be a cable management and space issue and they have a lot of things on their desk that might have to be done later. Um, but it's definitely something that if you can do while performing the assessment, just like you would do if you were at the person's work, you can do right then. And then finally, you'll have some recommendations potentially for equipment that might need to be made um, just because there's no other things that you can kind of do with the existing equipment they have. They need something more. And then lastly, you'll look at what the next steps, explain to them what the process is, because a lot of people have that. I feel like there's some reluctancy into the virtual assessment, but to be honest, they've been going so well. I think our office is really truly one virtual assessment um, that have been so successful, but they have questions with regards to now that we've talked, we've gone over, you know, some changes I can make. Now you're going to write a report. What happens with it and then address any questions they may have. So looking into the background information, what we're doing here, it was we're collecting information during the virtual assessment or prior. So it, it's kind of up to you. Um, I'm sure different ergonomists do this differently. I typically like to capture some of this information on a questionnaire ahead of time, and that would be what their job title is. So some just some general employee information. What are their duties? What are their hours, their breaks? Is their shift worked? Are they taking their breaks? And then report information. So just your standard reporting of the date that you're actually performing the virtual assessment and then the date that you're going to be writing the report and submitting it to a supervisor or a manager. And then the purpose of the ergonomic assessment. Why is it being completed? Why was it requested? Be careful here too, not to disclose too much personal information. I do find that often employees will tell me a lot more, but that's things that don't, you know, necessarily go into the report, but you know, further any recommendations I may make. And then there's the assessment information. This is a work history. So, you know, have they changed jobs recently? Has the work demand gone up? Is it a different workstation? Anthropometric information. This is mainly uh, their height. Are they right or left handed? And any discomforts or concerns they may have at that time. And the second part is the observation period. And this is where you're going to collect information on workstation arrangement. So it starts when the assessor collects those workstation images. So those observation period actually can begin before the assessment even takes place. It's that in that preparation work, but I mean, there's a different observation that happens when you're doing it as well, but you have an idea going into the assessment, what the risk factors are already. Now, mind you, there can be more information that comes to light during the assessment as well. Um, but what you need to you know, do during this observation period is you want to talk about any equipment that, you know, that might not they have referenced, like, for example, there might be duties that, you know, they're referencing documents and it's like, well, where do you put those documents? Do you put them in front of your keyboard? Do you put them to the side? And again, that's going to bring up some different risk factors that you may not have captured from those images. So here is an example, and Kelly showed a, uh, this a similar example, but you're going to work through these PowerPoint images and slides referring to a reference posture. And again, everyone does it differently, but we do the same thing too. You're always going to have this reference posture up there so they understand, okay, this is neutral posture. This is how my hands should be, and this is where my feet, they need to be on the floor. My knees need to be, you know, the, the whole 90, but then you can help uh, guide them through the measurements you want them to take by showing these lines then they have an idea of what you're talking about and even if you need any further adjustments you know if I'm asking someone to adjust a chair I will start pointing to different you know aspects on the chair of what I'm talking about because common language for us is not necessarily common language to the client who is performing the doing the things that we're asking them to do where normally if we were physically at the work site you know we might be you know get off your chair will adjust things for them and we walk them through the controls like that. 
So the adjustment recommendations can be made, like I said, at the time of the assessment, if that's ideally the, the best case scenario, but if for some reason they can't make them, uh, then they can always be done later. But some of these quick adjustments are monitors. You see the picture here and you see where the monitor location is to the right. Now that's gonna lead to neck rotation. We want that monitor centered directly in front of the person and increased in height. So you go through, you know, those different, you know, um, kind of key, things, I will have a lot of them, you know, put your hands out at shoulder height, you know, just to kind of get a gauge of where their hands are towards the screen to have an idea if they're looking up or they're looking down so I can let them know what type of adjustments may need to be made. And then there are times too where your webcam, it can be useful during these times to, you know, kind of take off and show some controls on the chair. I've done that before, especially if for some reason someone is sitting in the exact same chair I'm sitting in, which makes it really easy to tell them which, you know, which lever does what. When we look at work behaviors and recommendations, we first look to make some changes to work behaviors if you know possible, because a lot of these behaviors, it's just habits and you know, they're bad habits. They might take a little bit to change, but sometimes I always say, you don't know what you don't know. And people always are like, I never thought of it that way. And it's not meant to, you know, make anyone feel bad, but you, you're express, you know, your knowledge onto them. So changing a person's work behaviors can lead to significant improvements in their physical symptoms and their well-being. Um, I always tell people you don't want to sit all day and you don't want to stand all day. We were really meant to move. It's a way of starting to discuss strategies to help with movement. And, you know, there's always this important to address proper seated postures and any bad habits that could lead to discomforts. Like a lot of people have equipment like headsets sitting there not in use. Rather, they're holding the telephone. You know, express the knowledge on to them why it's important to use these types of equipment. They're provided for a reason. Reason, and even you might not be experiencing any discomfort right now, but cradling the phone between your neck and shoulder for long periods of time while typing may lead to that direction. And we will look at product and equipment recommend recommendations. Um, so recommendations for equipment are done to address the shortcomings of the workspace that could not be improved with adjustment to the equipment. An example of this is chair adjustments made to get the person into a neutral working posture with their upper extremities. Sometimes what this leads to is their feet are no longer supported properly. So a recommendation in this case may be to have a foot rest. And then in the, there's this kind of time period too. It's not like they're gonna get a foot rest showing up the next day. So what could be a temporary solution to support their feet? So this these were a lot of things used early in the pandemic i found when we didn't know how long people were going to be working from home you were trying to kind of use different things around the house to you know supplement being a document holder a foot rest providing additional support while they're seated so in this case you could use a box um a a case of water, something that, you know, they can get into neutral posture and make sure their knees aren't above their hips. And it's important to explain anytime you recommend something for someone, why you're recommending it. You know, it's addressing concerns. If someone is having some discomfort in their wrist, their job involves a lot of mousing. Well, you know, maybe it might be time to switch to some type of an alternative mouse to get you into that handshake neutral posture. So just really explain yourself. Like like Kelly mentioned before, with virtual assessments, it's a lot of communication. That's the one thing I found with it. You're really explaining yourself because you, you have the visuals, you're using different, you know, the PowerPoint, which is a great resource, but I find that you do communicate a lot. You really explain yourself to them and, and why you're doing, you know, what you're, you've suggested. And finally, the questions and next steps. You always really, before you entertain any questions, typically I tell them the next steps because often a lot of the questions have to do with what the next steps are. So the next steps after you've made them 
um, you know, do some adjustments of their equipment if possible, a report is completed. And this report then would outline any of the recommendations that you have actually spoke to them about during the assessment. And then that report is submitted to whomever requested it. So that could be a supervisor, someone from management, um, and it just depends on the assessor's role in relation to the company. So the next steps may vary. And then you give that individual the opportunity to ask any questions prior to ending the virtual assessment. There may be something that they didn't think about uh, regarding their job duties that, you know, might not be captured at the office right then, but is a concern of theirs. So it's always beneficial to address it then. I always tell them sometimes after the virtual assessment's done, if they think of something, uh, you know, shoot me an email because sometimes it's a lot to take in all at one time and you think of something later that you were hoping hoping to, you know, address. And then finally, a follow up. So you want to ensure that there, if their recommendations have been, you know, put in place and there is equipment that has been delivered, that they're using it properly. We don't want to see equipment there and it's there, but it's not being used because then obviously it's not helpful. It's not addressing any of the discomforts that the people have had prior to getting it. So you want to ensure that, you know, there is a time period that there is for follow up. It's not a way Please, um, I, I always provide them like, you know, reach out to me and follow up, but it's on them to really set it up. And, you know, as Kelly mentioned before, when you put a lot on the employees, sometimes it falls to the back burner. So I do reach out. Um, sometimes, especially for those, um, some clients that, you know, you really could tell that there is some difficulty there in making sure that they have everything set up properly for them. And so in those cases, sometimes they'll provide some pictures or they'll just reach out automatically and, you know, just, I want to make sure everything is going good. And sometimes it's just reflecting back to get some feedback that the, you know, the virtual was effective as well. So what not to do during an assessment? So it's really important with anything, you don't wanna just rely on subjective information. You wanna request that objective information wherever possible, and that comes with taking those measurements. Those PowerPoint uh, slides where it shows the, you know, exact measurements you're looking for are really helpful because you can say something in words and type it out to a person, but a picture really is worth a thousand words and that, you know, they grasp the understanding when you can get that and when you have their height too, and you're comparing it to measurements, that's always helpful too. You don't wanna overlook work habits either. Sedentary work behaviors need to be addressed. Like I had mentioned before, always talking about movement. We end up when people are at their desks, not moving enough and movement really is the key. We need to keep the blood flowing. And incorrect use of furniture. So again, like the headset um, example, if you have equipment there, you want to be able to use it, you want to use it effectively and use those, you know, accessories as all there for a reason. And another one too is a cluttered workstation. Clutter creates so many awkward postures and you don't want to overlook that. You can, you know, address those in, in classy ways, if, if you will, to ensure that they kind of tidy up a bit to get everything properly positioned so that they can work more effectively. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Kelly. Hey, thanks, Melissa. Um, I have a very cluttered workspace right now. You just reminded me I need to clean, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna go through the next couple slides is a little bit more tips and tricks on recommendations and the types of environments, the nuances and the type of environments that we're seeing. So let's talk about virtual assessments in the office. So yes, they are working in an office and a lot of the recommendations are going to be the same as if you were on site doing an assessment, you understand the equipment they have available to them, you've worked with the client, they understand that either new equipment comes in or they can repurpose them. Some of the things just to keep in mind in these cases is that employees had worked from home for quite a long time during the pandemic and the pandemic normalized that work from home, put a spotlight on the importance of proper workstation setup. And if some people were working from home with very poor setup, they may have already started to feel some discomfort. So you're coming back into the workplace, they have discomfort that may be left from their previous 
kitchen setup that they didn't have a real good setup at. So making, you might not see as many glaring changes, but you need to make those small changes to make them feel comfortable and do a lot of education. In hybrid, especially in an open address work environment, open address meaning nobody owns a desk, they could sit at a different desk each day they arrive at work, requires a very strong educational component, specifically on how to set up properly, how to use the equipment, how it adjusts, because each time they come to the office, it will not be set up for them and they will have to start from scratch. So this is some of the things, the nuances that we're finding in these spaces. Next slide. Okay, so from, from the, the home office, there's some, just some things that we wanted to note. Uh, recommendations in a home office only need to fit that employee. Uh, historically, in the large office space, we may have been trying to have as much adjustment and accommodation as possible because anybody could sit at that space, just like in that open address I just mentioned. Anybody could sit there, it needs to adjust for them. But if you're making a recommendation in a home office, it only needs to fit that person. It will not be used by others. And there might be cost-effective options you may not have considered in an office space for the home office. It may not have to have a full range of weight or height adjustments as long as it fits them. It may not need to be rated for 24 seven use. So there might be some more cost-effective, less adjustable pieces of equipment that might fit that person that you would, may not have considered before. Um, some employees, well, I'm not done yet, sorry. <laughs> some employees may have been given a stipend and they spend that money not on the right things. Always find out if they have purchased things and see if you can repurchase it. And employees working in a hybrid arrangement, the employee may support purchases for the office, but not from home. Just being really conscious that employees may have to do these things on their own and and or maybe asked to go back to the office full time if they're having an issue and they don't want to. So they're going to be open, I think, more to having some suggestions that are creative, um, even making some temporary setup recommendations, such as using these boxes in a sit stand to get them to see how much better they feel may make them more open and to spending the money to get into good equipment and utilizing it properly. Okay, next slide. Okay. So depending on the organization, there's also variability in how they will or will not provide equipment for employees in the home office. So this really does require some creativity. In one of the previous slides that uh, Melissa presented, you'll have seen that there was pillows behind back as you can in this, you see boxes, books, and pillows being used at a kitchen table. Being as creative as possible is going to be important in helping people in the home office. Equipment options have come a long way and sit stands and uh, chairs, there's some really good op uh, options that are not as pricey as they used to be, but you might have to do some research. You might have to um, provide some recommendations you wouldn't give somebody who is going into the office, but being creative and understanding what this person needs and how to accommodate them is important. Okay, next slide. Lastly, I just wanted to point out that there are still some real issues with working from home uh, that need to be overcome, whether it's working from home or in a hybrid situation. Uh, but our work environments, that hybrid or the work from home, I don't think is gonna be going away anytime soon. So we need to start thinking about these. Um, the ability to disconnect from work. We do have a new disconnecting policy in Ontario, which is related to communications, email, telephone calls, and being free from the performance of that work in off hours. However, if you have your office space in the same place where you do your day to day and you cannot close the door, shut the curtain, throw a blanket over it, it's sometimes difficult to disconnect from your work at home. I think this is something that we need to look at a little bit more and how it affects not just your work life, but your home life. Safety in the home is important. Now your home space is your workplace and we're still having these issues that what happens if there's an accident at home? What are the responsibilities of the employer? How do they help prevent those from ha happening? How do we enforce the recommendations that we're making? And how do we make medical accommodations if we're doing it in a home? These are still some gaps that we have in this space. Uh, one of the other things is emergency plans. Every workplace has an emergency plan, an evacuation plan, if you like to say it. We, there's a high recommendation for you to have one in your home. Does everybody have one? 
How can we guide those to take place and how are we going to enforce it? And then lastly, the, the cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is an issue for all of us in our everyday life, working from home, having your computer open, your Wi-Fi, who you're connected to, it all could expose the work, the work, so the employer to cybersecurity issues and maybe either an issue for the work from home environment or something to be considered by that employer in, in agreeing to that uh, work arrangement. So thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. I hope that we've given you some tips and tricks on how to make this virtual assessments successful. And we've also given you some things to think about, things that we still need to work on. So I think we're gonna open up right now to questions. Thank you very much, Kelly and Melissa. And I just wanna begin by apologizing. We, we don't know how this happened, but we recognize that there is a blue line that has appeared over some of the slides. We will correct that before we send the slide deck out to you and post it on our website. I think you've provided some incredibly fabulous reminders for us. I work at home 75% of the time and while working for Cree MSD, I think I'm working ergonomically correctly. However, today you have given us some excellent reminders of things to reconsider. One of the things we uh, wanted to check on was you mentioned the discomfort questionnaire survey. Is there a pre and a post that you ever do with clients to look at the impact of the assessment? Kelly, Heather, or sorry, I, was, I, I think I was on mute at first. Uh, it's blessed to hear. Um, we don't typically do a follow up questionnaire. Okay. I do reach back out, um, but not the official, you know, comparison, which would be a great idea and tool or resource to kind of use to, you know, for st statistics. So, an employer who might have purchased the service or used some of the resources, that might be something. Uh, for them to relook at how how they're doing related to MSD prevention and their employees. Something to consider. We've got quite a few questions here as well. Uh, you mentioned asking for employees height. Would you ask for more functional and workstation specific measurements like arm length, knee height, et cetera? Um, for myself, um, I typically, it, it depends if it, um, I guess once they send the images to me and based on their discomforts, sometimes there's a follow up that goes back out asking for some more detailed information. Um, like uh, Kelly had mentioned in hers, as far as the measurements, we usually have them do that while we're talking to them to have a measure a measuring tape with them if we need those measurements at that time. Arm length. Um, Typically, I don't ask for. We do have on our uh, website actually like an office ergonomic calculator that would provide, you know, you put more measurements into it as far as getting your correct seated height. But those are my main two that I ask because a lot of the times you look at the images and you can, it tells you a lot more. And then from those images is when further questions often come from myself. I'm not sure about Kelly. Yeah, I would agree with everything you said, Melissa. And then I would just caution um, when you're doing an office or go assessment, really spend time understanding the task that the employee um, is doing. The way that they have their office workstation set up is often based on how they have to work and complete those tasks. And that information is often really useful. Just having arm length and putting it into a calculator and getting a number out is not necessarily going to solve the problem that they're existing. You really need to look at the whole picture. It's going to give you a guide, yes, but you need to look at the whole picture. Thank you both. We have a question about movement, and I just want to point out that CREMSD has a few webinars on uh, movement and exercises. And the question is, can we recommend any exercises besides ergonomic furniture or equipment in between the breaks in virtual home workstations? I'm not sure if the two of you recommend or specifically have a, a resource that you wanna to point to other than some of our past webinars. Uh, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Kelly. Sorry. <laughs> I, um, I, I have like a, a 
info sheet on stretching for the office that I could probably share with someone. I, I look at stretching in the office as an opportunity for movement as well. Um, so if somebody needs to create movement and they feel comfortable, you know, it's not necessarily exercise, but it's providing a stretch break and it's movement, moving your body, and hopefully in the opposite direction of the movement that you've been sitting in all day. Melissa? No, absolutely. I, I'm really into walking, right? So even you think of um, at uh, the office that like go walk to a photocopier, walk to a printer, don't use your phone, get up and walk to the office. So try to take dip different opportunities to walk. I always say drink lots of water. You'll have to get up and walk to the washroom. But I, I'm really into like moving besides just stretching and exercising. Um, and it's a good way to you take a step away from whatever you're working on mentally. It recharges you and it doesn't have to be, you know, we're not looking at something long. It's those micro breaks that you really need to get the, you know, the blood flowing, changing posture. Thank you for that. Do you have or find any challenges with getting information back from the client in a timely manner? So, for instance, if you're asking for photos or questionnaire completions, aside from initial communication, and you have strategies to overcome this for those of us who want to do virtual assessments? Do you want me to go first? <laughs> I'll go sure. First. sure. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, we do have a barrier of getting the information back in a timely manner. And um, what we do is honestly, it's sending as specific information as we can with examples of what we need and then doing a follow up um, to try to get those done. Um, once the employee knows that we will not book their assessment time until we receive those photos, that sometimes also helps initiate getting them. Um, but as I said, there are some people who are just so busy they don't. We do track how many times we've uh, contacted them. And we also provide education even if they don't have an assessment. So if they, obviously before we do the assessment, we try to give them like an, uh, depending on our client, the education session. Um, but if they haven't had that already, we'll send that to them. At least they have something that they can watch in their own time to try to help uh, correct the issues that they have. Thank you. And, and just in the spirit of privacy, do you have any comments about how clients submit their information? Is it through a portal or through secure email? For us, it's um, it's secure email is how it's done. And it's uh, often uh, depending on how the virtual is arranged, you may have the, you know, the employee that's getting the virtual and the manager do the initial, you know, contact to me, but then when it comes to me sending the questionnaire and them returning it, that's just between me and the client, because a, a lot of times I do find that sometimes there's some personal information disclosed that they don't want the employer to know. So we really try to keep it separate. And like I mentioned, it's not mentioned in the reports, but it helps guide me through and understand why, you know, maybe they're feeling this way at their workstation and what their needs are. Can you say a little bit more about the report? We have a question around the letter that goes to the employer, assuming there is a formal report that goes back to the employer. Um, I well, so the formal report is um, similar to the report that I would do if I went on site. Um, so the initial reach out to the to the client, it's a standard you know formal email that begins the contact, then the discomfort you know questionnaire and pictures coming back, and then from there I do a, a report like I would any other report that I would write if I physically went to the work site. Um, and everything is that we've talked about as far as any changes made during the assessment to the work, uh, the workstation are captured in that report, as well as any recommendations for further equipment. Okay. Any other comments on that before I go to our last few questions? We have a very interesting question related to recovery, and that is, and I think you've addressed some of this, that it's not just furniture that has to be looked at. Can the MSDs be fully recovered by ergonomic furnitures applied by the employees? I think that's a fantastic question. <laughs> really, um, I think it, it depends on how or when in the process, the ergonomist is being engaged. 
Um, as I mentioned, we do try to do proactive training so that if, if there's new employees, they're receiving that training from day one and they have the ability to set up their workstation as best possible, even for our home environments. So we would have somebody be re receiving training on how to set up their home environment as best possible. Um, so, but if they haven't set it up properly, and then they don't contact us until they've actually gone off work, then the likelihood of full recovery decreases. So can ergonomic, I'm, I'm gonna say it has to be done in conjunction with a really good medical based program in order to have full recovery. Um, open to your interpretation, Melissa. No, I uh, I completely agree, Kelly. It's uh, sometimes or more often than not, ergonomists are called in in a very reactive manner. And unfortunately, that does make it very difficult. So like Kelly mentioned, being involved proactively from the get-go is where we want to fill more of that space. Um, and it would, you know, go a long ways into prevention of MSDs. Thank you. I just want to address the uh, image question related to quality reference images. So we certainly do have some great resources on the MSD prevention website related to images, ergonomically correct positioning. And I will ask both Kelly and Melissa, are there other resources that you use related to ergonomic images? I, I'll go first, and I'm going to say that I was had the opportunity to check out the website, the new website, um, a little bit early, and it is fantastic, and the images are fantastic, and I actually tend to use the Cree MSD uh, images quite a bit, um, so I, I that would be where I would go to first, and in, I mean, I'm lucky enough to work with clients that are open to creating images, so. Um, in addition to the creation of images, we also will take photos that are good postures. And if you can't have an image, like a drawn picture, you can have a photo that is ideal. And those, uh, as long as you have the permission of the person, you could do it of yourself and give yourself permission to use it. Those are useful as well. Great. I'm gonna ask you two back-to-back -back questions and they're related to reporting. So is there a software program that be can convert a pictorial image into the look of an architectural sketch. And also is a report template that can be shared that you use that goes back, maybe that you use in even putting together your email. I don't know the answer to the first question. Okay. A little bit outside my realm of expertise. Same. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there are from a, a digital human digital twin perspective. I think there's real estate stuff that's out there that could probably be really interesting to do a deep dive into. But um, report formats, I do have report formats. Um, they tend to be intellectual property to a certain degree. I can see if I have something generally. And Melissa, you have a more open capability to share. Maybe you have one that's that's open and capable of sharing. Yeah, I might have um, have one or I can kind of um, make something up, but I mean, in general, um, it, you know, you have the background information, uh, you, like it, it kind of follows through almost like kind of like a, a study, if you will. And mind you, we don't put um, like there's there. I've wrote longer reports with a lot of literature and backing up um, our reports. I do tend to do more of a Cole's note just because of the, you know, Oak house, you know, we are our free service. And so we're all strong so far. So it's um, in comparative to what I've done before, but I can can kind of provide you uh, a little bit of what we we do and how we report it in the general email of what we what we ask. Okay, I'm going to jump really quickly to our last two questions that we can fit in today. If, um, if a worker does not have the proper setup, for instance, an example of a chair that doesn't have armrests that go low enough or a key, uh, keyboard on a kitchen table, do you stop the assessment until they've purchased the proper equipment and then return back to the assessment? No, no, I was going to say, I'm assuming that's why they got the assessment. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would say, no, you continue the assessment, make sure you do that full, full assessment, ensure you have an understanding of everything that they need. 
support them through getting what they need in place, and then absolutely do a follow up to ensure that it's it's set up properly. Absolutely. So I have done follow ups where there's like two or three follow up um, just to make sure that they have received everything and that it's set up properly. Thank you so much. The last question is, can adequate lighting and temperature control influence on ergonomics and injury prevention? Absolutely. Lighting, I, I find in housing is um, that was is a, a main concern too, because often people's office setups, there's a lot of natural lighting that people like to position themselves around. And um, that is probably the main one I find um, is very influential. It's actually a lot more influential when you go back to the office because people like a lot less lighting, um, especially working from home. You do have the ability to control it a bit more, which is nice. Um, but, you know, positionally, if you have outside windows, you want to be perpendicular to them. You want to reduce any type of uh, glare or reflection that can happen. And um, temperature, I find, um, for housing, I don't hear as many, um, you know, working from home complaints as it, I do in an office. And same with lighting, just because there typically is a more of ability to control it. I see a lot of people using a lot more task lighting, um, eliminating overhead lighting as well. Thank you. And I just want to close by saying that adequate workplace design does contribute to the prevention of musculoskeletal disorders. And please check out our redeveloped MSD prevention guideline website. You will find a proliferation of incredible workplace office resources to help prevent injuries. Thank you so much, Kelly and Melissa. And we look forward to seeing all of you in June. Have a great rest of the day.